custody was a 21-year-old woman who had previously lived in Ealing before she was kicked out by her family and had to move north. She didn't often think about her family anymore. She missed them, even if they didn't always accept of who she was. Although, she would never miss her father. She missed her brother especially, though. They'd grown up together and shared such a close bond when they were little. Cassidy knew that he accepted her, and maybe one day, just hopefully, they'd see each other again. Cassidy had always been a great fan of science fiction. She'd grown up an avid fan of Star Trek and Red Dwarf. But never in a million years had she expected to live in one of her wildest fantasies. Her room was quite tidy considering her busy and hectic life. She had lived in quite a small flat, which she just about managed to pull together with the odds and ends of her photography career, as well as the help of her former editor and best friend, Rani Chandra. She worked her way through her usual morning routine, which involved casting away her duvet and switching on the TV to get the latest news and headlines. She would then go to the kettle and make a cup of coffee and crumpets. Cassidy always looked more tired than she was, because she felt her life was so dull and uninteresting. She yearned for a more exciting life, a life of magic, adventure and danger. The kettle clicked after an intense two minutes of boiling away ferociously, like a trapped tiger. Cassidy was just filling her mug when she heard the story of a fallen star on the news. They were reporting that it was some kind of meteor, but it didn't, hadn't left any kind of scorch marks at the crash site. Yet the officials were certain something fell through the atmosphere at precisely 12.02am this morning. They did, however, find a strange tubular object at the scene. It looked like some kind of strange alien artefact with cracked porcelain edges, a purple crystal emitter and tough metal claws holding it all together. The handle was certainly starting to show its age, as the thumb hole looked like it was about to snap off. Cassidy thought it was totally worth investigating, so she forwarded the article on her news app to Rani and turned the TV off. In doing so, she put down her phone and reached for her coffee, only to realise she'd dropped it and would have to make another cup. A shard of ceramic had sliced her arm open, so she quickly reached for some stitches to sew up her wound. She looked down at the coffee. It reached into all corners of the floor and almost looked like a vacant face, staring right back at her. Cassidy paused for a moment, looking down at the spillage before mopping it up. At 9.45am, Cassidy was ready to go out to work. She had a meeting with her editor at around 10.30, and she was sure that if she was late this time, her head would definitely be on the chopping board. She had already missed the deadline for her last selection of photographs of the latest government prick, who had promises they knew they couldn't deliver. So instead, Cassidy had been out with Rani looking into strange UFO sightings. She hoped that her boss would share her interest in the event, because she desperately needed to keep her, her job, as she was already behind on her payments for her flat. And if she missed another uh, payment, she'd get kicked out by her landlord. This was when she hit a stroke of luck. As she exited her flat, slamming the door behind her, some student had been given out leaflets, and one of them had landed on her doormat. Normally, Cassidy would usually discard these, but she saw that the company in question was a Zygote Industries, a peculiar name, she thought to herself. They were looking for volunteers to give DNA samples. The leaflet looked very professional, like a posh hotel brochure. There was even a cash payment of £50,000, which would be more than enough to cover her flat payments for the month, and buy herself a new camera, which would hopefully mean she'd be able to get work outside the local paper. The paper in question was the Newcastle Chronicle which was often handed outside train stations and immediately thrown into the bin by commuters. Cassidy had checked to make sure she had her keys, which were attached to a pink, blue and white lanyard around her neck, which was almost smoothed down by her pins of Disney characters and even a Starfleet logo or two. Once Cassidy had locked up, she put her on her leg of her jacket and fastened her brown boots and ambled her way down the stairs, of the bygone city monolith of a tower of people packed together like a long-forgotten sardines and down to her bus stop. Once she got on the bus, she was greeted by an old lady who took the bus every day to see her grandchildren. Her daughter had been ill and she'd been offering to babysit. 
Cassidy felt so bad for her, and so she brought her a coffee when they got off their bus in central town and parted ways for work. There was an unsettling air about the place as Cassidy walked through the bustling crowds and to her offices. A dark, foreboding wind encompassed the city. Cassidy could feel like it was a storm brewing. When she reached her offices, she looked up to the sky to see grey and bitter clouds looking down at her from above as she entered the cold and empty offices. It was strange. Cassidy looked at her watch. It was 10.15. Usually at this point, the offices were crowded with people going to and fro, but not today. Cassidy went to the offices to sign in, but still no one was there. Not even Tish, who was a secretary who worked on weekdays. Must be a bank holiday or something, Cassidy reasoned in her mind. Just as she was about to exit again, Cassidy thought she might as well give the office a try and see who was in. So... She turned around to make a move for the lift. She pressed the button on the left to summon the lift down. It took an unusually long time before it arrived, but once it did, Cassidy immediately got in and pressed the button to take her to floor 10. The doors closed behind her, and once she was out of view, a fluid blob-like monster took the shape as Tish the secretary. The lift arrived from the 10th floor, and the doors opened. Cassidy walked out, slightly on edge, taking her steps slowly, hoping someone, anyone, would pop out and say good morning to her. Even Janet the janitor was nowhere to be seen. Cassidy found her mop leaning against a wall, desolate and forgotten. As Cassidy looked closer at the wall, she noticed that dripping down the wall was a lurid orange goo, which trickled gently down the wall. Cassidy was repulsed, yet couldn't find the urge to reach in and touch it. She felt its texture was like some kind of PVA glue or cheap kids' glue. It was sticky, and so she decided to rub it off on her jeans. She noticed a familiar-looking sign. The Zygote logo from the leaflet she had found on her doormat that morning was an almost monocle-looking logo, clearly designed to vaguely represent that of a Zygote cell. They were clearly new in town and Cassidy wondered if maybe perhaps they had something to do with the odd behaviour in the office that morning. That was when, at last, her boss called her into the office. Cassidy, you're early, he said in a slightly bemused manner, yet also completely vacant of expression. Cassidy looked round to see what appeared to be almost a shell of her boss. He seemed to look exactly as he normally did. His loose tie, piercing belt and suit was all present. His scruffy hair and wrinkled face as normal, yet something seemed off. Like his posture, for instance. He never stood upright. He always slouched back like a sloth. Not to mention the smell. He'd never been the greatest man and guy in the first place. But even now, he stank of something unpleasant. It made Cassie's nostrils flare up like a firework. Are you feeling well, Cassidy? He asked stiffly. Cassidy was unsure, so she simply shrugged and said, I'm okay, I guess. Cassidy had the photos in a plastic wallet, which she had got out in the lift. Are those the photos? Her boss demanded to know. Uh, contemplated Cassidy as she debated it on her mind whether to hand the photos over or not. Yeah, I I guess, she said, as she slowly raised the photos towards her boss, only for him to grab her by the arm and take them. Cassidy quickly moved her arm away as she backed away slowly. I've given everyone the day off. You can go into town and do some fluid consumption, suggested her boss, in a dark, commanding voice. Cassidy expressed her confusion. Do you mean go out for a drink or something? Yes, yes, run along, fellow human, said her boss as he went back into his office. Cassidy was about to call the lift and go home when she decided to do some nosy looking around. She pushed on the door opposite to her boss's office and into Zygote Incorporated. Inside, the office was empty, no desks or swivelly chairs, not a free pen or photocopier in sight. Cassidy did find traces of what looked like more of that strange goo on the walls, though. 
She also found a giant sign on the wall featuring the Zygote logo, as well as the name of their government sponsor. Serval. Cassidy was about to leave when out came a nurse. He was tall and quite well built up. He struck quite an intimidating figure, really. While he smiled away, Cassidy couldn't help but think, what if there was some malicious force awake within him? Have you come to volunteer? he said bluntly. Cassidy remembered that they were genetic engineers and just decided to go along with it. Yeah, yeah, I am. Would you please come with me? he commanded. Cassidy felt a sense within her telling her to get the hell out of there. She went against her better judgment and followed him into the practice room at the end of the office. Inside, the nurse took out a rather large needle and told her to take a seat on the operating chair. She noticed there were straps on the arms of the chair. She wondered what possible use they could have for them. The nurse took the needle and injected it deep within her vein to withdraw the blood. Cassidy noticed that close up on their face, the nurse had a small yet visible red-looking sucker, almost like the kind you find on an octopus tentacle. Cassidy dismissed this as merely acne or something. The nurse withdrew the needle and handed her a cheque for £50,000. Thank you very much for your donation. We shall find it very useful, the nurse stated, like it was almost reading off a script or a manual. Is that it? Fifty grand for that? Your donation will mean more to my bosses than that small amount. Please leave, the nurse stated. If you say so. Have a nice day then, I guess. Cassidy said, trying to be as polite as possible, so as not to let on how nervous she was. Cassidy noticed an organic-looking door behind a plastic curtain. It looked like it could have been made from some kind of genetic cross between a raw beef burger and tree weeds. What's through there? Cassidy inquired. It is of no consequence to you. Please leave now, the nurse commanded, as he showed Cassidy out of Zygote HQ and down the lift. Once Cassidy exited the lift, she saw Tish. She waved at her to say hi, but she was met with no reply. Cassidy guessed that she should leave, but something was clearly wrong. That was when she got a text from Rani. Simply read, we need to meet now. It was now later in the afternoon and Cassidy was at her favourite coffee shop, Pink Lane Coffee, eating a bagel and taking soft sips of her flat white. She was sat on a brown leather sofa waiting for Rani to turn up. She was coming in via train, so it was bound to take a little while. Cassidy kept running the events of the day through her head. It all seemed so strange. Something was definitely wrong. But who could she tell? The police would probably think she was crazy. She had to rely on Rani. She'd dealt with stuff like this before, with her friend Sarah Jane. Some of the stories she told were mad, like the Mona Lisa coming to life, or the trickster. But Cassidy was starting to debate if maybe, after all... It was all true. Finally, Rani arrived. She was a tall and confident woman and she filled the room with her vibrant clothing choices and charming smile. She was carrying a red satchel and a large black ring binder folder. Rani went over to a white-tiled bar to order a vegan cappuccino and paid for this with a contactless card and put a little change in the donations box before going to sit down next to Cassidy on the sofa. Hi, Rani greeted Cassidy like a close friend, although a great amount of time had passed since they last met. Cassidy returned the greeting. Hi, long time no see. I think we've been overdue a chat, especially given the circumstances, Rani replied, as she organised her things onto a table and almost knocking her bagel onto the floor. Yeah, I've missed you. Everything was so much better when you were my editor. Cassidy said, trying to cover up the fact that she'd been struggling to make ends meet since Rani's paper closed. I'm sorry I haven't been able to help, but when Sky vanished, I've been working round the clock to find her. But when I saw that article you sent me, I knew I needed to see you, Rani explained, noticing a slight tension in Cassidy's voice. Cassidy was a bit upset that it took a few flying saucers to bring Rani back to her, given how close friends they'd once been. Well, we're here now, and I guess it's okay. It's really not. I should have been here a long time ago. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Rani said in a guilty tone. Cassidy smiled through shallow tears, remembering being kicked out by her family and not having her best friend there for her. It had been tough, but at least they were back together. How's your brother, Rani inquired. 
Still with them, Cassidy said as she rolled back another tear. I think he's afraid of what they might do if he left them. But we text sometimes. I am really sorry, you know. I really did let you down as your best friend, Ronnie said. If there's anything I can do, just just let me know, you know. I'm going to be here for you from now on. I promise. Cassidy pulled herself together with a tough, unbeaten smile. Right, now for the dramatics, let's get down to business. Right, declared Rani as she spread open her folder. This is the facts that I've gathered so far. At some time after midnight, locals in Newcastle spotted a strange glowing energy above Newcastle Tower before landing somewhere in the centre of town. But there's no markings or anything. Rani pointed to an area at the centre of the map with lots of offices and a street near Quayside. This was particularly notable for Cassidy, as that was where she worked. That's not possible. I worked there and there was, there was nothing there. However, there was something odd about the atmosphere there this morning. Something I couldn't quite put my finger on, remarked Cassidy, as she recalled the bizarre events of the morning. It was like the whole office was dead and everyone was acting like zombies. Rani sat back as her cappuccino arrived. She put her finger on her chin as she thought about what Cassidy was saying. Was there anything significantly different? Ronnie asked. Yeah, said Cassidy as she took a deep gulp of her coffee. There was this new company that moved in. Zygote Incorporated, she explained as she reached for a leaflet that she picked up this morning. They deal in genetic engineering or something, she said as she passed it over to Rani. Interesting, Rani expressed as she flicked through a leaflet. You didn't take a peek inside, did you? Well, you know me. Of course I did, Cassidy replied. But it was well freaky. There was this nurse and my God, he stank. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it was just disgusting. He took my blood for some research thing in return for, Cassie said, as she rumbled through her bag to retrieve the cheque that he had handed her earlier. This, she said, handing the cheque over. Ronnie examined the note. It looked suspiciously familiar. She had dealt with fake notes with Sarah Jane when they first off Mrs Wormwood. Could this be a similar affair, she thought? Ronnie had inherited Sarah Jane's watch scanner after she had died, which she flicked open so she could see what this cheque really was. She was right. There was something alien about the cheque. It was most definitely a fake. Whoever it was didn't intend Cassidy to check the cheque in. Which probably meant she was in danger, perhaps grave. Danger. It's a fake, Riley told Cassidy. Definitely a fake. In fact, there's something wrong about all of this. Yeah, Cassidy pondered. You know what I think? What? I think we need to do some investigating, Cassidy replied with a broad smile as she sat back to take a large chomp out of her bagel. Once they'd finished their lunch, they both decided to take a walk down the high street. The streets were quite soft, oddly, and winding like a fine smoked tea in architecture. There was a light breeze swaying around them as they strolled up the high street. Cassie looked in at some of the shops, desperately knowing that she couldn't afford any of them. That's when she spotted someone she could have sworn looked just like her. Rani noticing that Cassie had stopped in the middle of the busy street and turned to look at her. Are you okay? she asked. You look worried, very worried. Cassie snapped out of it. Oh, it's nothing. She said, looking down. Only I could have sworn. I'm sure it's nothing, she said, as she looked up to see the night drawing in. Slow, but steady, like an oil lamp simmering out of existence. It was now evening, and the streets were consumed by shadows and phantoms of the dark. While the rest of the world was sleeping, it seemed only Cassidy, Rani, and the demons of the night were awake. They stuck to their shadows, moving around like elegant, undetectable ninjas ready to get to the heart of this dark and abhorrent business. They had arrived at Quayside. It was as desolate as the night sky and as silent as death itself. The water from the River Tyne drifted along like a distant traveller in a long coat, swaying to the pulse of two hearts. Cassidy had been here before, but not like this. She felt as if she was on the brink of something she shouldn't quite interfere with, yet she felt like a calling was coming towards her, telling her to go on. It was now evening, 
and the streets were consumed by shadows and phantoms of the dark. While the rest of the world was sleeping, it seemed only Cassidy, Rani, and the demons of the night were awake. They stuck to their shadows, moving around like elegant, undetectable ninjas, ready to get to the heart of this dark and abhorrent business. They had arrived at Quayside. It was as desolate as the night sky and as silent as death itself. The water from the river Tyne drifted along like a distant traveller in a long coat, swaying to the pulse of two hearts. Cassidy had been here before, but not like this. She felt as if she was on the brink of something she shouldn't quite interfere with, yet she felt like a calling was coming towards her, telling her to go on. The streetlights provided little comfort as they dimmed quietly that night. There were light, subtle, and concealing the dark inside. Rani approached Cassidy from behind. Let's do this, she said softly, as they went behind the intimidating office and through a back entrance. Cassidy had never been in this way. The back street was leading to this door, which felt cramped, and she felt as if she was a lemon ready for the squeezing. That's when she almost tripped and fell. She was unable to stop herself, but she put her hand to the ground, unable to see what she tripped on. Like a blind mouse, she felt all around and found a familiar tubular object. It was the same object from the news report. It hardly seemed possible. She she thought it was in the hands of police investigators. Yet here it was. It was almost like an anchor pulling her into a world, a whole new world that she couldn't possibly comprehend. She pressed a button on the slider and it illuminated the back street with hope, not provided by the street lamps allowing her to see a path forward to a large, bulky steel door, with Rani in front of it, waiting for Cassidy to arrive. "'What's that?' she asked. "'I don't know. I just found it,' Cassidy said, taking a look at it, examining the fine porcelain cracks and the crystal at the centre of the emitter, whilst holding it tight to the circular handle. Rani acknowledged this and turned to the door. "'How are we going to get in? It's locked,' Cassidy inquired, putting the sonic into the pocket of her leather jacket." I've got a present from an old friend, she said, as she got out what appeared to be a gold-battered lipstick case. A lipstick, exclaimed Cassidy with an unnerving eyebrow lift. This isn't any old lipstick, it's Sonic, Ron explained as she took off the lid and twisted up the case to reveal a silver nib with a scarlet emitter on top. Rani pointed the lipstick at the lock of the door and then pressed down firmly on the button located at the base of the Sonic. This created a rather irritating buzzing din, accompanied by a bright crimson glow which encompassed the lock like a laser from a ray gun. There was an audible shook-shook noise as the lock mechanism released. Rani pushed the door open. After you, she said politely as Cassidy walked through. Showing off much, Cassidy teased as she was followed on by Rani. There was a large lever by the door which Cassidy pulled. This made a dim emergency light illuminate to reveal a staircase, which led deep underground, by the looks of things. Cassidy noted that there was even more of that slime she spotted earlier in the zygote offices, this time soaking the walls almost like a wet paint. The potent perfume from hell that she'd smelt in the offices earlier that day was also present here, but more dense and toxic. It even seemed visible. It was like a tank of gas filling up. Down the stairway to hell, Rani remarked, as she tread carefully onto the first step and down into the canyon of despair. Cassidy was shaking a little, but she still followed on. The pathway was as rocky and as stable as a cliff, and it seemed like some of the steps were as jagged as knives. The journey down felt like an eternity, going on and on and on, until finally they reached the bottom of the dark tunnel. They entered what appeared to be some kind of hidden basement. They both felt a cold trickle of fear run down their necks. The room seemed dark and dingy, with mould consuming the room like a cancer reaching in to take apart the structure of the room. Plaster was hanging on the wall like the last thread of a long scarf about to fall to their death. There was a strong wind coming from inside and Cassidy and Rani felt compelled to go further down. There was a tunnel 
which if Cassidy had her geography right would lead directly under the River Tyne. She could hear the quiet drips of water, drip-dropping, and felt like an intense heartbeat, drawing them further in. This way, Rani indicated to Cassidy as they followed the sound of the dripping. Cassidy homed in on this noise as if she was a mouse sniffing a cheese. It seemed so distant, yet so close at the same time. Rani ahead flipped open her scanner watch, but she used to scan the slime. As she did so, Cassidy noticed that she had a look of intense concern. What is it? Cassidy inquired, still distracted by the dripping. It's hard to tell. There appears to be some human DNA structure. You know, your usual double helix structure, you know. But there's something else too. It's like it's galvanising itself, binding itself with the DNA structure of another species. It's sort of a hybrid. A new result popped up on Rani's screen. It can't be. What is it? Cassidy asked, but she was met with no reply. Tell me what it is, she commanded to know. It's bad news. Double bad news. It's the DNA. It's sort of bonding, but it's bonding to that of a Zygon. A sort of shape-shifting alien, Rani explained. So I was right then. Aliens, exclaimed Cassidy excitedly. Rani still looked worried. It gets worse. The human DNA, it registers as your DNA print. There was a pause where Cassidy tried to understand what all this meant. Whatever these Zygons are planning, you must be a big part of it, Rani stated. This was when there was a noise, like someone collapsed on the floor. Cassidy moved in to see who it was. Hello? Is someone there? Do you need any help? She called out. There was no reply. So Cassidy moved further in and out of view of Rani. This is when what seemed to be a wall shifted to reveal a red organic looking door. Rani peered in, but she was grabbed by a ferocious creature and pulled in. Meanwhile, Cassidy found what looked like a dead body lying on the ground. They seemed still lifeless and wrapped in raggedy clothing, which seemed far too big for them. Almost that like they were a kid in their dad's clothes. Hello there, she said, crouching down beside them. From behind, the goo was mutating into a new form, slowly crunching together from red goo to limbs and then organs formed together until they came into what looked like an identical copy of Cassidy. The copy walked, almost like a corpse or a scarecrow, jagged with its arms reaching out for Cassidy from behind. Do you want me to call a doctor? Cassidy asked. I don't need a doctor, they said, looking up at Cassidy. They had a timeless look about them, and a whole universe of wonder in their eyes. Their hair was curled, and on one side it was shorter than the other. Because I am the doctor, the original, you might say, they explained before falling unconscious again. Then, from behind, the copy revealed itself to Cassidy and clawed at her before thudding her against a wall ready to drain the life out of her completely. Cassidy found herself on the brink between life and death. It's often said that the eyes are the doors to the souls. But in death, your eyes often go back to things that you long lost and forgotten. Memories that are awakened, that you've left deep in your soul, like a box of photos discarded on a shelf collecting dust. Cassidy's eyes were ocean blue, so blue you could almost hear the crashing of waves and call of seagulls. For Cassidy, her eyes took her back to a holiday on the Isle of Wight, looking out at the sea, looking out to the very edge, desperate to reach out and run away and never return her brother at her side, as they walked across the beach, all while their world behind them, collapsing into rampant but familiar argument of words, which stabbed through her heart like a billion sabre-toothed sharp knives. Cassidy was on the brink, between life and death. On one side, the coolest seagulls lured her, the sun and her wish for a life where she'd lived in blissful ignorance of the challenges of life. On the other side... A new chance, a chance to fight, although hard and would knock you down. There was always a chance, that hope for a better life just round the corner. Cassidy chose to run towards hope, 
After all, she'd been chasing it all her life, and she wasn't about to stop now. Cassidy felt a breath of life awaken her. Now, her eyes showed her the mirror-like appearance of her duplicate. Her eyes, now fiercer than ever, this sent a shiver down her duplicate's back as it throttled her. Then Cassidy remembered, if she was an exact duplicate, then she would have the same weaknesses too. So she put immense pressure on the hand which she had scolded that morning by her and dug her fingernails right into the area of her arm which she sliced open on the ceramic. This caused her duplicate to lose their grip on Cassidy. Cassidy felt a rush of oxygen which she used as power to kick right into the centre of their face, kicking them straight out. Cassidy went to down to check if the doctor was okay. She had no idea who they were or how they got there, but they were cold. Cassidy didn't know what to do, so she checked for a pulse. It was impossible. They had two separate pulses, both a bit thruddy, but seemed steady. Cassidy looked around. She noticed that Rani was nowhere to be seen. Rani, she called out. Where are you? There was no response. Cassidy was starting to feel anxious. She'd never felt so isolated in all her life. Then suddenly, as if they could sense the pain, the doctor awoke. Cassidy felt a sense of relief as life bled into the doctor's cheeks once again. Hello there, they said bluntly. And who might you be? Cassidy was a bit starstruck, not entirely sure how to respond. I'm Cassidy, she replied. I think. You think? Well, yes, that's my name, she explained. What's yours? The doctor. They would continue to reply in the same blunt tone, as if this fact was more obvious than the answer to one plus one. Just the doctor? Yeah. But Doctor Who? Cassidy inquired, not realising just how big a question that was to ask. Now that's the million dollar question, replied the doctor as they sat up against the wall. Now, based on this wall, I'd say we're some 50 metres below the River Tyne, which puts us under Newcastle city centre, right? Yeah, how did you know that? Cassidy asked. A magician never reveals their secrets, the doctor replied, putting their finger to their nose. Not to mention your Geordie accent. Well, I guess that makes sense. If you don't mind me asking, who are you and why are you here? (laughs) She asked in an agitated, slightly unnerved tone. Yot had their hand on their head. You know, my head has never felt so bare. I really must get a new hat. I love a good hat. You know what would be great? One of those massive hats with feathers and fruit. Oh, God, I'm hungry. I don't think I've felt hungry in a while. I don't suppose you have any fruit on you. Now, the idea in my mind is sort of like orange apple. I know, banana, they said with an intense leaning right into Cassidy's face. Why a banana in particular, Cassie said with a raised eyebrow and a smirk. Bananas are good, they said as they stood up. Look, are you okay, Cassidy asked. What would make you say that? I have my reasons, Cassidy replied sarcastically. The doctor noticed that Cassidy was clutching onto the sonic screwdriver in her pocket. What's that you got there, they inquired. Oh, this, she said Cassidy, removing the sonic screwdriver from her pocket. Oh, I don't... No, I just sort of found it outside. I just thought it was a piece of junk, she said, handing it over to the doctor. It's not important, is it? she asked. The doctor clutched it for a while. They knew it had significance, but they couldn't remember why. It was like a faded memory or a dream, a sort of vacant memory of who they had been, but a stronger, more compelling pull into the future. It was like a tug of war in their mind, and they felt as if they were slowly being pulled apart. The doctor could sense memories of running up and down corridors and fighting monsters, but the focus was blurred and decaying. They didn't know who they were. They were like an alien to their own body, unable to remember anything. The doctor applied a soft pressure to the slider button on the handle, and the sonic blew up the entire room, while a soft hum played. While Gallifreyan language or something lined the walls, like projections... It was unlike anything Cassidy had ever seen. The symbol was the light. It was beautiful, she thought to herself. What is it? It's who I am, the doctor replied, looking up. Soon distant voices could be heard, old friends and faces of the doctor. Their granddaughter Susan. Ian, Barbara, Vicky. 
Joe Grant, the Brigadier, Sarah Jane, Romana, all smiling down on them. There must be no regrets, no tears or anxieties. You must go forward in all your beliefs and prove to me I am not mistaken in mind, said one echo of the Doctor. When I say run, run like a rabbit, said another. Then a swirl of purple light swirled as the stars glistened and passed them by. The grind of lost, forgotten engines travelling by. The echoes returned. Would you like a jelly, baby? said a grinning buffoon. Reverse the polarity of the neutron flow, said a dandy in a sharp dinner suit. Brave heart, said a youthful blonde cricketer. An alien spy, replied a gloriously dressed, curled time lord with a fine brow. Unlimited rice pudding, said a short, stumpy wizard of a time lord. Then reds and dark nebulas take over as a dark, menacing presence arrived. Centuries of war and destruction consumed all light. Daleks, Cybermen, Yeti, Zygons, Weeping Angels and even the K-1 robot, along with more indescribable terrors that the Doctor had faced over their many years. A curled, dapper Time Lord appeared. They were yelling, Shoes! They fit perfectly! Then the darkness revealed itself again. They saw children burning and soldiers watching in the unending bitter war between the Time Lords and the Daleks. An older doctor, wearied by centuries of fighting, walked shamefully towards them. Great men are forged in fire. It is the privilege of lesser men to light the flame. Then a sparkle of hope appeared as a younger northern Time Lord with pointy ears popped up and simply said, Run. Then... There was a sorrowful affair, as on the beach, the doctor said goodbye to Rose. Then the pain of losing Amy and Rory consumed them. Cassidy began to notice that the memories were enveloping the doctor, almost as if they were part of them. A Scot with really intense eyebrows proclaimed, I will not change, before another youthful blonde, also confused, came up to the doctor and said, I'm the doctor. When people need help, I never refuse. Before all the future and past incarnations of the Doctor spoke in indistinguishable ramblings, before coercing together and consuming the Doctor in one big explosion of stars, light and time, all in one box which hurtled towards them, the lights faded away and they were back in the tunnel again. All of that, that's that's you? Cassidy asked in awe of what she'd just seen. The doctor nodded. It's who I'm supposed to be. But it's all just words. It's nothing but who I really am deep down. I have to discover what it means to be me, to be my version of the doctor. And that's something my memories will never give me, they said sorrowfully. Cassidy wasn't sure what to think. She don't, she'd just seen a billion lives and a universe of unimaginable adventure, yet also pain and despair. She wasn't entirely sure how to comprehend it. Whatever it meant, this doctor, whoever they are, they clearly needed her. The sonic began to beep ferociously. Oh, that's worrying, the doctor said, reading the results on their sonic. What is it? said Cassidy, leaning in to see what it was, even though she just had no idea what it meant. I'm detecting a dangerous energy source, explained the doctor, turning brown to face the wall. And whatever it is, it's behind that wall. Suddenly, a door starting to emerge, cobbling itself together from goo on the wall. It looked like it was made of all kinds of organs, flesh, and even a bit of alien plant life thrown in there. Shall we? asked the doctor as they opened the door for Cassidy. Let's, she replied, as they climbed through the door with a smile, followed on by the doctor. Inside was a dimly lit hatchery. The room followed the same organic mix of slabs and alien flesh and plant life. What little light there was was dark, blood, red, foreboding colour, which seeped into the corners like an infestation of maggots. All around the room were oval-shaped pots. Cassie looked into one of them and noticed more alien goo, only its form was fluctuating between goo and an alien creature and a familiar human form. The creature was a large, muscular beast with terrifying eyes which looked like they'd been carved deep into their flesh. 
Their skin was the same blood red tone as the light, only it seemed deeper and looked almost like raw human skin. The goo seemed to seep in and out of the creature's pores like a deadly infection. The creature's pores only grew wider and wider and almost looked like an octopus sucker. That was when the creature turned back into a human. Cassidy realised why they'd looked so familiar to her. It was Joe Biden, the President of the United States of America. Cassidy looked into another pod. It was Boris Johnson. In another, Angela Merkel. In every pod was a major world leader. But what could this mean, Cassidy thought. The doctor used their sonic screwdriver to scan the entire circumference of the hatchery. They looked at their readings. This whole hatchery goes on for miles, they said, reading the results to Cassidy. But that would mean this would cover the entirety of Newcastle, Cassidy stated. Well, a bit bigger than that. But I don't think we're underneath Newcastle anymore, they explained. Well, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. We are and we aren't. This whole space is dimensionally transcendental. And that means, well, in short, the room we walked into is bigger on the inside, the doctor explained to an incredibly confused Cassidy, who looked as though she'd been asked to solve the most complicated math sum in history. If I had my ship, I could show you a good example. Sadly, I have no idea where it is, they said. Then they walked into what looked like an archway, which led to an alcove. The doctor curiously walked through, followed by Cassidy. The alcove had a railing around it and a staircase which looked to lead to a rather expansive chasm, stacked up with the creature's ponds. They were lined up like products on a conveyor belt, ready to be shipped across the world. The Doctor and Cassidy stood in awe of their view. There must be thousands of people here, Cassidy stated. They're not people, they're Zygons. And what are Zygons, Cassidy asked to the Doctor astutely. Zygons are a race of alien shapeshifters, and their planet was destroyed in war. So, they came to Earth seeking to take over the planet, before an agreement was reached between the humans and the Zygons, allowing them to seek asylum, the Doctor explained. But something must have gone wrong. Whatever this is, this isn't the Zygon style at all, they said with a worrying expression. This was when Cassidy spotted Rani on the floor. She looked to be unconscious. Cassidy ran to her aid. She first checked her pulse. It was beating steadily. She's alive, Cassidy called out to the doctor. That's some good news. But now we need to get down to business, the doctor stated, with a great sense of urgency, as they climbed down the stairway. As they turned round the corner, they found a worn-down police box, looking derelict and decrepit, abandoned like a house on the edge of a street. The doctor could sense the great presence of the police box, like it was a lost friend who had been reunited after many centuries. They ran their hands down the aged and crooked wood. Who am I? they asked the machine. The TARDIS lit up with a soft, majestic hum, unlike anything in the universe. The doctor felt the last of their regeneration energy expel from their body. Their eyes glowed a dazzling gold colour. That was when they knew. They knew what it truly meant to be the Doctor. The compassion, the hope, the bravery, and the fury of the Time Lord, as they realised the TARDIS was slowly moving towards its death. Rani had awakened. What did I miss? She said with a devious smile, looking up at Cassidy. You missed a lot, she said, glad to see Rani was awake again. I think I found Sarah Jane's Doctor. Ah, okay, Rani replied with a slightly off expression. Cassidy was starting to wonder if something was wrong with Rani. She quickly dismissed these thoughts, thinking she was bound to be a bit off, as clearly she'd had quite the blow to the face. She thought, noticing a rather large red circular spot on her head. Rani got up and looked around, almost like a snake in a bird's nest, slithering and examining each pod. This is when Cassidy's attention was drawn to one pod in particular. There was something drawing her towards it. The face, the person inside, although blurred out of view, seemed familiar. Then Cassie's attention was grabbed by a sudden reoccurrence of the noise of the door, sealing itself. Elsewhere, the Doctor had also noticed this noise, although heavily distracted by a cable which they had noticed exiting from the TARDIS doors and up the walls leading to a central power duct directly above them, which all the pods were connected to. This was when they noticed the TARDIS was dying slowly after being drained like a victim from a lustful vampire. 
If the Doctor had ever had a friend they'd ripped the part of the universe for, it was the TARDIS. The fury intoxicated the Doctor, their hearts pumping ferociously. The Doctor's noticed that on the side panel of one of the pods, there was a Zygon gun. They removed it and set the trigger to kill. Cassidy moved towards the door, noticing that it was now locked. Then, also realising that her Zygon duplicate was likely the one to seal them in, which meant that somewhere her duplicate was crawling around, ready to attack. Cassidy walked around cautiously, hearing a scuttling all around her. She turned round, and there where the Zygon creature was, right in front of her face, dribbling right down her neck. Oh, shit, she said before the Zygon knocked her unconscious and carried her and Rani away. The doctor, now carrying the gun, quickly ran upstairs to find Cassidy. They were ready to wage war against the creatures that had slowly been killing the TARDIS. When they found no one, they knew something had gone wrong. Very wrong. Then, suddenly, if out of nowhere, a sour, wet voice played over the intercom. Doctor, lay down your weapons. We have your friends. If you do not comply, we will destroy them, the creature commanded. Oh yeah, the doctor said, pulling up their gun and pointing it at one of the pods. Well, if you want to deal in ultimatums, they replied, firing a powerful bolt of energy at the pod containing Boris Johnson's duplicate. This caused the pod to explode violently, like an egg smashing onto the floor, killing the Zygon creature within, which lay in a puddle of its own goo before slowly disintegrating into goo itself. How many pods will it take before you release my friends, I wonder? They stated in a rather menacing tone of voice. They will die, Doctor, the creature replied, starting to get weary of the Doctor's now nonchalant attitude towards killing the entire Zygon hatchery. And so will your very ugly looking homies, replied the Doctor. Homies? Yeah, maybe not. How about planet-threatening army? You see, we appear to have reached an impasse. Can we come to an agreement, suggested the Doctor, in a way that made them look like an overacting theatre actor playing to a crowd? The Zygon decided to transmit the Doctor down to the lower levels, where it was keeping Cassidy and Rani captive. The Doctor had barely flinched. They looked ready for a confrontation with the creature. Cassidy and Rani were chained to the wall and were sitting on the floor with their hands and shackles above them. So, Doctor, what do you make of my ultimatum now? The creature said with a silly smile as he made it abundantly clear to the Doctor. Whatever you've done, whatever your plan is, you better start packing, they threatened. Such bold words for one who no longer has the advantage in this ordeal, Doctor, smiled the Zygon maliciously. I see you have changed your face, but it seems your incomprehensible compassion remains the same. Your eyes, though, they are filled with bloodlust. Would you do it? said the creature, looking down at the gun still in their hand. You know, I really don't think you could, the slithering tongue said, while circling around the doctor. The doctor pulled up the gun to the Zygon's huge, bulbous head. There you are, the real Time Lord, just like the rest of the Zygon grinned. No, you can't, Cassidy intervened. The Doctor looked at Cassidy as she looked deep into them disapprovingly. This isn't the way. You don't need to use violence. It should never be an option. Whatever they've done, whatever their plan is, if you pull that trigger, it will make you just as bad as them. Use your mind. That's the only weapon you need. The Doctor reflected on everything they'd learned about being the Doctor. The anger was like fire. But it was weak and feeble compared to the compassion and kindness they felt. In the end, it was always kindness that won all. I don't know who I am, or what I'm meant to be, the doctor stated, quivering over the trigger. Cassidy smiled. Then we'll discover it together. The doctor smiled back and threw over the sonic screwdriver to Cassidy, who released herself from Rani, and the doctor lowered the gun. You win they said as a sudden rumble from above. What is happening? The Zygon asked desperately as the ground began to shake. Your fault, really. You used my TARDIS to power your hatchery. And, well, you made her mad. And when she gets mad, she tends to get a tad exploding, the Doctor said with a massive grin. 
as the ground began to shake even more intensely. In short, they continued, run. Out of nowhere, an emergency alarms began to ring like never before, and lights flashed everywhere as the infrastructure rapidly began to collapse. The Doctor and Cassidy and Rani all ran for their lives, while massive chunks of the ceilings collapsed to stop on the Zygon. Cassidy called out after the Doctor, We should help them! She suggested. Therefore, the doctor ran back with Cassidy. However, Rani went on ahead, locking them inside to suffer their fate. Good luck, humans, she malevolently said before transforming back into a Zygon creature to make her escape. Doctor! Cassidy called out, noticing they'd been shut in. However, they were too busy to help the Zygon. Quickly, more and more, the rock was falling around them. Cassie found lying under a rock. The real Rani. She was sure about it this time, she hoped. She was unconscious and needed urgent help. She seemed they were too late. The whole stability of the hatchery was collapsing. Was this the end, Cassidy thought, holding on to Rani, while the doctor moved desperately to try and open the sealed door. Cassidy closed her eyes again. Instead of hearing the noise of the seaside, she heard a majestic engine grinding in and out of reality, making an ancient warp warp noise. Then flashes of light filled the room, spreading hope into every corner of the tunnel. It was the TARDIS. She was alive. Then, all of a sudden, the entire hatchery blew up, like a match, but a million times bigger. Cassidy had passed out. The rest of what happened was blurred out of her vision but she remembered awakening in a large console room. This room seemed alive with the bustling of energy flowing from circuit to circuit, yet it was far more than a machine. It was alive. In the centre was the central control column, with a child's dream quantity of buttons and switches to flick. An almost crystalline pillar ran through it. It glowed a deep purple colour before reaching into the cracked and porcelain lid. All around, she found clock faces, almost like roundels in the walls, which were made of varnished wood. The clock seemed to tell the time for multiple different time zones. One read Versailles, 1879, and another read Dixa Papapella, 2345. At the top of the TARDIS, there was a balcony with shelves, books, chalkboards, and all traditional-looking theatre curtains, which were stained a rose-red colour. It seemed there were cogs and patterns of clocks engraved onto the floor, and at the centre there was a large omega symbol, with a crack splitting straight through it like a fractured egg. Cassie looked next to her at Rani, who was there. She too was beginning to wake up. Where were they, she, she thought. She got up and nosed about, looking for the Doctor and that Zygon creature. That's when the Doctor approached her from behind. Are you looking for me? Possibly, she said, turning around to face them. I see you survived. She looked down at the doctor from head to toe. They were now in a completely different look. They looked much better on them than the baggy clothes they had been wearing previously. They were quite tight-fitting and made the doctor look a bit like a dandy, with frilly cuffs and a long black overcoat decorated with bronze buttons and purple lining. They were now wearing white shirt with huge collars which stuck around the lapels of the overcoat. They had question marks on both sides embroidered in a silky gold string. They even had a lilac-coloured cravat and patterns of flowers from alien worlds printed on it. They wore a waistcoat with patterns of clocks printed onto a greenish-gold colour. They had bulky yet airy trousers tucked into much-aged adventurer's boots, not too dissimilar from Cassidy's own choice of footwear. To top it all off... They wore a large feather-decorated hat, which concealed their face almost entirely, except for the doctor's distinctive smile, overall creating a look which seemed neither masculine or feminine. I see you had time to get yourself some wicked new threads, though, Cassidy said with a smile. Rani had fully got up and came to join them. If you don't mind me asking, she said in between the yawn, are we dead? Not this time, the doctor replied with a light chuckle. Where are we then? Rani inquired. On the TARDIS. But hang on, you said the TARDIS blew up, Cassidy stated before being silenced by the Doctor. Did I? Well, you see, the thing about the TARDIS is she's a tough old girl, they said before moving on to the controls to set the coordinates. What happened to the Zygons? Cassidy asked, worried that the Doctor had let them all die. The Doctor looked down in shame. 
I couldn't save them, they said, avoiding eye contact with Cassidy, who had moved closer towards them. You're right, I shouldn't have gone that far. I was able to save one, though, the one who threatened us. I took them to a friend of mine in Wales who's been handling the Zygon Earth integration policy. You did your best in the end. That's what matters, she said, comforting the doctor, seeing the pain in their eyes. The doctor looked into Cassidy's eyes and quickly moved on to another panel of the console. Now! You've got a decision to make, the doctor prompted to Cassidy and Rani. Oh, and what's that? Rani asked. Well, I can take you home, or we can go anywhere in the entire universe. Any when to, aliens, demons, there'll be lots of danger, of course, too, said the doctor, almost as if they were trying to sell a TV show to a TV executive. That's all very well, but I got grounded by the Jadoon, so as much as I'd love to stay, I don't really want them on my back again, Rani said, thinking of the time she'd ended up having to lug a Jadoon captain around Ealing to stop Andrabax. And what about you? She asked the doctor, turning to look at Cassidy again. Cassidy paused for a moment as she considered the pain of the last few years of her life. All the missed rent payments, the day she was kicked out, and her brother Eric, of course. She knew already what her answer would be. But she had to think of everything she was leaving behind. She looked to Rani. Should I? It's your decision. I'll be here waiting for you. Your life, everything, will all still be here. A very old friend on Earth told me that life on Earth can be an adventure too. You just need to know where to look. Well, here it is. The greatest adventure you'll ever live. Rani took off the scanner device and took the lipstick out of her pocket. Here. I'd always hoped that the doctor would come back for her one day. For one last trip. If you take these, she said, handing them to Casty, you'll make her wish come true. Go do her proud. Go make Sarah Jane Smith proud for me, she said through tears of both joy and sorrow. Cassie leaned in to give Ronnie a hug as she accepted the lipstick and the watch. I'll do my best, she said, crying with Cassidy. I'll take that as a yes, then, the doctor intervened. Cassidy smiled through tears, streaming down her face. Yes, yes it is. But first, she said, wiping away her tears, Let's get Rani home. Just as she said that, the TARDIS engines ground to a halt with a massive thud. Newcastle, 31st of May, 2021. It's all yours, the Doctor stated, Rani said, as her farewells before exiting the TARDIS and leaving the Doctor and Cassie alone. Now, where do you want to start? The Doctor asked. Ooh, I don't know. Let's go where the universe takes us. Let's go into the unexpected. Cassidy said with a smile as the doctor flicked a switch, sending them across the time vortex and into the unknown. <laughs> <laughs>